The Maypole of Marymount by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Bright were the days at Marymount, when the Maypole was the banner staff of that gay colony. They who reared it, should their banner be triumphant, were to pour sunshine over New England's rugged hills and scatter flower seeds throughout the soil. Jollity and gloom were contending for an empire. Midsummer Eve had come, bringing deep verdure to the forest and roses in her lap of a more vivid hue than the tender buds of spring. But May, or her mirthful spirit, dwelt all the year round at Marymount, sporting with the summer months and reveling with autumn and basking in the glow of winter's fireside. Through a world of toil and care, she flitted with a dreamlike smile and came hither to find a home among the lightsome hearts of Marymount. Never had the maypole been so gaily decked as at sunset on a midsummer eve. This venerated emblem was a pine tree, which had preserved the slender grace of youth while it equaled the loftiest height of the old wood monarchs. From its top streamed a silken banner, colored like the rainbow. Down nearly to the ground, the pole was dressed with birchen boughs and others of the liveliest green, some with silvery leaves fastened by ribbons that fluttered in fantastic knots of twenty different colors but no sad ones. Garden flowers and blossoms of the wilderness laughed gladly forth among the verdure, so fresh and dewy that they must have grown by magic on that happy pine tree. Where this green and flowery splendor terminated, the shaft of the maypole was stained with the seven brilliant hues of the banner at its top. On the lowest green bough hung an abundant wreath of roses, some that had been gathered in the sunniest spots of the forest, and others of still richer blush, which the colonists had reared from English seed. O oh, people of the Golden Age, the chief of your husbandry was to raise flowers. But what was the wild throng that stood hand in hand about the maypole? It could not be that the fawns and nymphs, when driven from their classic groves and homes of ancient fable, had sought refuge, as all the persecuted did, in the fresh woods of the West. These were Gothic monsters, though perhaps of Grecian ancestry. On the shoulders of a comely youth uprose the head and branching antlers of a stag. A second, human in all her points, had the grim visage of a wolf. A third, still with the trunk and limbs of a mortal man, showed the beard and horns of a venerable he-goat. There was the likeness of a bear erect, brute in all but his hind legs, which were adorned with pink silk stockings. And here again, almost as wondrous, stood a real bear of the dark forest lending each of his forepaws to the grasp of a human hand, and as ready for the dance as any in that circle. His inferior nature rose halfway to meet his companions as they stooped. Other faces wore the similitude of a man or woman, but distorted or extravagant, with red noses pendulous before their mouths, which seemed of awful depth, and stretched from ear to ear in an eternal fit of laughter. Here might be seen the salvage man, well known in heraldry, hairy as a baboon, and girdled with green leaves. By his side, a noble figure, but still a counterfeit as appeared an Indian hunter with his feathery chest and wampum belt. Many of this strange company wore fool's caps, and had little bells appended to their garments, tinkling with a silvery sound, responsive to the inaudible music of their gleesome spirits. Some youths and maidens were of soberer garb, yet well maintained their places in the irregular throng by the expression of wild revelry upon their features. Such were the colonists of Marymount, as they stood in the broad smile of sunset round their venerated maypole. Had the wanderer bewildered in the melancholy forest heard their mirth and stolen a half-affrighted glance, he might have fancied them a crew of cummis, some already transformed to brutes, some midway between man and beast, and others rioting in the flow of tipsy jollity that foreran the change. But a band of Puritans who watched the scene, invisible themselves, compared the masks to those devils and ruined souls with whom their superstition peopled the black wilderness. Within the ring of monsters appeared the two airiest forms that had ever trodden on any more solid footing than a purple and golden cloud. One was a youth in glistening apparel, with a scarf of the rainbow pattern crosswise on his breast. His right hand held a gilded staff, the ensign of a high dignity among the revelers, and his left grasped the slender fingers of a fair maiden, not less gaily decorated than himself. Bright roses glowed in contrast with the dark and glossy curls of each, and were scattered round their feet, or had sprung up spontaneously there. 
Behind this lightsome couple, so close to the maypole that its boughs shaded his jovial face, stood the figure of an English priest, canically dressed, yet decked with flowers in a heathen fashion, and wearing a chaplet of the native vine leaves. By the riot of his rolling eye, and the pagan decorations of his holy garb, he seemed the wildest monster there, and the very comus of the crew. "'Votaries of the maypole!' cried the flower-decked priest. "'Merrily, all day long have the woods echoed to your mirth. "'But be this your merriest hour, my hearts. "'Lo, here stand the Lord and Lady of the May, "'whom I, a clerk of Oxford and high priest of Marymount, "'am presently to join in holy matrimony. "'Up with your nimble spirits, ye Morris dancers, "'green men and glee maidens, "'bears and wolves and horned gentlemen. "'Come, a chorus now, rich with the old mirth of merry England, and the wilder glee of this fresh forest, and then a dance to show the youthful pair what life is made of, and how airily they should go through it. All ye that love the maypole, lend your voices to the nuptial song of the Lord and Lady of the May. Well, this wedlock was more serious than the most fairs of Marymount, where jest and delusion, trick and fantasy kept up a continual carnival. The Lord and Lady of the May, though their titles must be laid down at sunset, were really and truly to be partners for the dance of life, beginning the measure of that same bright eve. The wreath of roses that hung from the lowest green bough of the maypole had been twined for them and would be thrown over both of their heads in a symbol of their flowery union. When the priest had spoken, therefore, a riotous uproar burst from the rout of monstrous figures. "'Begin you the stave, reverend sir,' cried they all. And never did the woods ring to such a merry peal as we of the maypole shall send up. Immediately a prelude of pipe, cithern, and vi viol, touched with practiced minstrelsy, began to play from a neighboring thicket in such a mirthful cadence that the boughs of the maypole quivered to the sound. But the May Lord, he of the gilded staff, chancing to look into his lady's eyes, was wonderstruck at the almost pensive glance that met his own. Edith. "'Sweet lady of the May,' whispered he reproachfully, "'is yon wreath of roses a garland to hang above our graves, "'that you look so sad? "'Edith, this is our golden time. "'Tarnish it not by any pensive shadow of the mind, "'for it may be that nothing of futurity will be brighter "'than the mere resemblance of what is now passing.' "'Well, that was the very thought that saddened me. "'How came it in your mind, too?' said Edith, "'in still a lower tone than he, "'for it was high treason to be sad at Marymount.' Therefore do I sigh amid this festive music. And besides, dear Edgar, I struggle as with a dream, and fancy that these shapes of our jovial friends are visionary, and their mirth unreal, and that we're no true lord and lady of the May. What is the mystery in my heart? Just then, as if a spell had loosened them, down came a little shower of withering rose leaves from the maypole. Alas for the young lovers! No sooner had their hearts glowed with real passion than they were sensible of something vague and unsubstantial in their former pleasures, and felt a dreary presentiment of inevitable change. From the moment that they truly loved, they had subjected themselves to earth's doom of care and sorrow and troubled joy, and had no more a home at Merry Mount. That was Edith's mystery. Now leave we the priest to marry them, and the maskers to sport around the maypole, till the last sunbeam be withdrawn from its summit and the shadows of the forest mingled gloomily in the dance. Meanwhile, we may discover who these gay people were. Two hundred years ago and more, the old world and its inhabitants became mutually weary of each other. Men voyaged by thousands to the west, some to barter glass beads and such like jewels for the furs of the Indian hunter, some to conquer virgin empires, and one stern band to pray. But none of these motives had such weight with the colonists of Marymount. Their leaders were men who had sported so long with life that when thought and wisdom came, even these unwelcome guests were led astray by the crowd of vanities which they should have put to flight. Erring thought and perverted wisdom were made to put on masks and play the fool. The men of whom we speak, after losing the heart's fresh gaiety, imagined a wild philosophy of pleasure and came hither to act out their latest daydream. They gathered followers from all that giddy tribe whose life is like the festal days of soberer men. In their train were minstrels, not unknown in London streets, wandering players whose theaters had been the halls of noblemen, mummers, rope dancers, and mountebanks who had long been missed at wakes, 
church ales and fairs. In a word, mirthmakers of every sort such as abounded in that age, but now began to be discountenanced by the rapid growth of Puritanism. Light had their footsteps been on land and as lightly as they came across the sea. Many had been maddened by their previous troubles into a gay despair. Others were as madly gay in the flush of youth, like the May Lord and his lady. But whatever may be the quality of their mirth, old and young were gay at Merry Mount. The young deemed themselves happy. The elder spirits, if they knew that mirth was but the counterfeit of happiness, yet followed the false shadow willfully, because at least her garments glittered brightest. Sworn triflers of a lifetime, they would not venture among the sober truths of life, not even to be truly blessed. All the hereditary pastimes of old England were transplanted hither. The king of Christmas was duly crowned, and the lord of misrule bore potent sway. On the eve of St. John, they felled whole acres of the forest to make bonfires and danced by the blaze all night, crowned with garlands and throwing flowers into the flame. At harvest time, though their crop was of the smallest, they made an image with the sheaves of Indian corn and wreathed it with autumnal garlands and bore it home triumphantly. But what chiefly characterized the colonists of Marymount was their veneration for the maypole. It has made their true history a poet's tale. Spring decked the hallowed emblem with young blossoms and fresh green boughs. Summer brought roses of the deepest blush and the perfected foliage of the forest. Autumn enriched it with that red and yellow gorgeousness which converts each wild wood leaf into a painted flower. And winter silvered it with sleet and hung it round its icicles till it flashed in the cold sunshine itself a frozen sunbeam. Thus each alternate season did homage to the maypole and paid it a tribute of its own richest splendor. Its votaries danced round it, once at least in every month. Sometimes they called it their religion or their altar, but always it was the banner staff of Marymount. Unfortunately, there were men in the New World of a sterner faith than these maypole worshippers. Not far from Marymount was a settlement of Puritans, most dismal wretches who said their prayers before daylight, and then wrought in the forest of the cornfield till evening and made it prayer time again. Their weapons were always at hand to shoot down the straggling savage. When they met in conclave, it was never to keep up the old English mirth, but to hear sermons three hours long, or to proclaim bounties on the heads of wolves and the scalps of Indians. Their festivals were fast days, and their chief pastime the singing of psalms. Woe to the youth or maiden who did but dream of a dance! The selectman nodded to the constable, and there sat the light-heeled reprobate in the stocks. Or, if he danced, it was round the whipping post which might be termed the Puritan Maypole. A party of these grim Puritans toiling through the difficult woods, each with a horse load of iron armor to burden his footsteps, would sometimes draw near the sunny precincts of Marymount. There were silken colonists sporting round their Maypole, perhaps teaching a bear to dance, or striving to communicate their mirth to the grave Indian or masquerading in the skins of deer and wolves which they'd hunted for that especial purpose. Often the whole colony were playing at blind man's buff, magistrates and all with their eyes bandaged except for a single scapegoat, whom the blinded sinners pursued by the tinkling of the bells at his garments. Once it is said they were seen following a flower-decked corpse with merriment and festive music to his grave. But did the dead man laugh? In their quietest times, they sang ballads and told tales for the edification of their pious visitors, or perplexed them with juggling tricks, or grinned at them through horse collars. And when sport itself grew wearisome, they made game of their own stupidity and began a yawning match. At the very least of these enormities, the men of iron shook their heads and frowned so darkly that the revelers looked up, imagining that a momentary cloud had overcast the sunshine, which was to be a perpetual there. On the other hand, the Puritans affirmed that when a psalm was pealing from their place of worship, the echo of which the forest sent them back seemed often like the chorus of a jolly catch, closing with a roar of laughter. Who but the fiend and his bond slaves, the crew of Marymount, had thus disturbed them? In due time, a feud arose, stern and bitter on one side, and as serious on the other as anything could be among such light spirits as had sworn allegiance to the Maypole. The future complexion of New England was involved in this important quarrel. 
Should the grisly states establish their jurisdiction, jurisdiction over the gay sinners, then would their spirits darken all of the clime and make it a land of clouded visages, of hard toil, of sermon and psalm forever. But should the banner staff of Marymount be fortunate, sunshine would break upon the hills, and flowers would beautify the forest, and late posterity do homage to the maypole. After these authentic passages from history, we return to the nuptials of the Lord and Lady of the May. Alas, we have delayed too long, and must darken our tale too suddenly. As we glance again at the maypole, a solitary sunbeam is fading from the summit, and leaves only a faint golden tinge blended with the hues of the rainbow banner. Even that dim light is now withdrawn, relinquishing the whole domain of Marymount to the evening gloom, which is brushed so instantaneously from the black surrounding woods. But some of these black shadows have rushed forth in human shape. Yes, with the setting sun, the last day of mirth had passed from Marymount. The ring of gay maskers was disordered and broken. The stag lowered his antlers in dismay. The wolf grew weaker than a lamb. The bells of the Morris dancers tinkled with tremulous affright. The Puritans had played a characteristic part in the Maypole mummeries. Their darksome figures were intermixed with the wild shapes of their foes, and made the scene a picture of the moment, when waking thoughts start up amid the scattered fantasies of a dream. The leader of the hostile party stood in the center of the circle, while the rout of monsters cowered around him, like evil spirits in the presence of a dread magician. No fantastic foolery could look him in the face. So stern was the energy of his aspect that the whole man, visage, frame, and soul, seemed wrought of iron, gifted with life and thought, yet all of one substance with his headpiece and breastplate. It was the Puritan of Puritans. It was Endicott himself. Stand off, priest of Baal, said he with a grim frown, and laying no reverent hand upon the surplice. I know thee, Blackstone. Thou art the man who couldst not abide the rule of even thine own corrupted church, and hast come hither to preach iniquity, and to give an example of it in thy life. But now shall it be seen that the Lord hath sanctified this wilderness for his peculiar people. Woe unto them that would defile it. And first for this flower-decked abomination, the altar of thy worship. And with his keen sword, Endicott assaulted the hallowed maypole. Nor long did it resist his arm. It groaned with a dismal sound. It showered leaves and rosebuds upon the remorseless enthusiast. And finally, with all its green boughs and ribbons and flowers, symbolic of departed pleasures, down fell the banner, Staff of Marymount. As it sank, tradition says the evening sky grew darker, and the woods threw forth a more somber shadow. There, cried Endicott, looking triumphantly on his work, there lies the only maypole in New England. The thought is strong within me that by its fall is shadowed forth the fate of light and idle mirth-makers amongst us in our posterity. Amen, saith John Endicott. Did Governor Endicott speak less positively, we should suspect a mistake here. The Reverend Mr. Blackstone, though an eccentric, is not known to have been an immoral man. We rather doubt his identity with the priest of Marymount. Amen, echoed his followers. But the votaries of the Maypole gave one groan for their idol. At the sound, the Puritan leader glanced at the crew of Comus, each a figure of broad mirth, yet at this moment strangely expressive of sorrow and dismay. Valiant captain, quoth Peter Palfrey of the Ancient of the Band, what order shall be taken with the prisoners? I thought not to repent me of cutting down a maypole, replied Endicott. Yet now I could find in my heart to plant it again, and give each of these bestial pagans one other dance around their idol. It would have served rarely for a whipping post. But there are pine trees now, suggested the lieutenant. True, good agent, said the leader. Wherefore, bind the heathen crew and bestow on them a small matter of stripes apiece, as earnest of our future justice. Set some of the rogues in the stocks to rest themselves, so soon as Providence shall bring us to one of our own well-ordered settlements, where such accommodations may be found. Further penalties, such as branding and cropping of ears, shall be thought of hereafter. How many stripes for the priest? inquired the ancient palfrey. None as of yet, answered Endicott bending his iron frown upon the culprit. It must be for the great and general court to determine. 
whether stripes and long imprisonment, an other grievous penalty may atone for his transgressions. Let him look to himself. For such as violate our civil order, it may be permitted us to show mercy. But woe to the wretch that troubleth our religion. And this dancing bear, resumed the officer, must he share the stripes of his fellows? Shoot him through the head, said the energetic Puritan. I suspect witchcraft in the beast. Well, here be a couple of shining ones, continued Peter Palfrey, pointing his weapon at the lord and lady of the May. They seem to be of high station among these misdoers. Methinks their dignity will not be fitted with less than a double share of stripes. Endicott rested on his sword and closely surveyed the dress and aspect of the hapless pair. There they stood pale, downcast, and apprehensive. Yet there was an air of mutual support and of pure affection seeking aid and giving it that showed them to be a man and wife with the sanction of a priest upon their love. The youth in the peril of the moment had dropped his gilded staff and thrown his arm about the lady of the May, who leaned against his breast too lightly to burden him, but with weight enough to express that where destinies were linked together for good or evil. They looked first at each other and then into the grim captain's face. There they stood in the first hour of wedlock, while the idle pleasures of which their companions were the emblems had given place to the sternest cares of life, personified by the dark Puritans. But never had their youthful beauty seemed so pure and high as when the glow was chastened by adversity. "'Youth,' said Endicott, "'you stand in an evil case, thou and thy maiden wife. Make ready presently, for I am minded that ye shall both have a token to remember your wedding day.' "'Stern man,' cried the Maylord, "'how can I move thee? Were the means at hand, I would resist to the death. Being powerless, I entreat. Do with me as I will, but let Edith go untouched.' "'Not so,' replied the immitigable zealot. "'We are not wont to show an idle courtesy to that sex, "'which requireth the stricter discipline. "'What sayest thou, maid? "'Shall thy silken bridegroom suffer thy share of the penalty besides his own?' "'Be it death,' said Edith, "'and lay it all on me.' "'Truly, as Endicott had said, the poor lovers stood in a woeful case. "'Their foes were triumphant and their friends captive and abased in their home desolate.' the benighted wilderness around them, and a rigorous destiny in the shape of the Puritan leader, their only guide. Yet the deepening twilight could not altogether conceal that the Iron Man was softened. He smiled at the fair spectacle of early love, and he almost sighed for the inevitable blight of early hopes. Hmm, the troubles have come hastily on this young couple, observed Endicott. We will see how they comport themselves under their present trials ere we burden them with greater. If among the spoil there be any garments of a more decent fashion, let them be put upon this May Lord and his lady instead of their glistening vanities. Look to it, some of you. And shall not the youth's hair be cut? asked Peter Palfrey, looking with abhorrence at the love lock and long glossy curls of the young man. Crop it forthwith, and that in the true pumpkin shell fashion, answered the captain. Then bring them along with us, but more gently than their fellows. There be qualities in the youth which may make him valiant to fight and sober to toil and pious to pray. And in the maiden, that may fit her to become a mother in our Israel, bringing up babes in better nurture than her own hath been. Nor think ye, young ones, that they are the happiest even in our lifetime of a moment, who misspend it in dancing around a maypole. And Endicott and the Puritan of all who laid the rock foundation of New England lifted the wreath of roses from the ruin of the maypole and threw it with his own gauntleted hand over the heads of the Lord and Lady of the May. It was a deed of prophecy. As the moral gloom of the world overpowers all systematic gaiety, even so was their home of wild mirth made desolate amid the sad forest. They returned to it no more. But as their flowery garland was wreathed of the brightest roses that had grown there, so in the tie that united them were intertwined all the purest and best of their early joys. They went heavenward, supporting each other along the difficult path which it was their lot to tread, and never wasted one regretful thought on the vanities of Marymount.